All right, here we go. Um, if you're if you're look, looking for the Tuesday Bible chat with the uh, March thirty first, twenty twenty, with the topic anxiety, you're in the right place. Uh, so let me offer a prayer, and then um, I'll I'll tell you what we're going to do, and then we'll just get started. Again, I want to remind you that you are being recorded, and we probably will use this on a YouTube, our YouTube channel there. So just just, Stop, bird. What do you want? Just be aware. Oh. Somebody's bird. That was awesome. So let me offer a prayer. Father in heaven, we're grateful to gather. Pray that you would bless us as we have a conversation with one another and interact with what the Bible says. Uh, help us to, um, to love the truth, even as we seek the truth. Help us to love the truth. And I pray that you would uh, grant to us um, just a really good time this evening, something substantive and fun. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, guys, let's talk about anxiety. And I'm not sure who I'm going to be able to see and who not. So uh, I'm going to, I have, I have my little chat box open. So if you want to uh, throw a question in here, that's fine. I'll do my best to answer that. Well, hello, Otts. It's good to see you guys. Yeah. All right. So here are, here are his, uh, a very simple dictionary definition of uh, anxiety. Uh, a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Uh, then the psychiatrists <clears throat> you have a more particular um, a definition, and there, this would be from the, from the realm of psychiatry, a nervous disorder. So anxiety, just localized general anxiety can become a psychi psychiatric disorder. A nervous disorder characterized by a state of excessive uneasiness and apprehension, typically with compulsive behavior or panic attacks. Compulsive behavior or panic attacks. So that's, that's anxiety that's uh, taking over somebody's life. Uh, so you might be interested, there are, a bunch of, there are a bunch of synonyms in the English language for the, for the word anxiety, which I think means that we are well acquainted with anxiety uh, in our world. Here are some synonyms for anxiety. Worry, stress, tension, fear, concern, fretfulness, unease, disquiet, the German word angst, edginess, and apprehension. Those are all, then there are more. Those, I just picked out the ones that I thought were the most common uh, and out of a thesaurus for, of synonyms for anxiety. So there are a bunch. Um, so what... So that's all I'm going to say definitionally. Uh, and if you have other things you want to add to that, you can add to them later. So we'll, we'll have a, I'll pause periodically for conversation. So that I'd give, I've given a definition. I've given a few synonyms. And I just want to briefly talk about causes of anxiety. Uh, first of all, I think the main cause of anxiety in our lives is fear, just being afraid, afraid of all kinds of things. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the Greek word uh, is phobos. And we get our uh, English phobia from it, and they're all manner of phobias, uh, and that that can become psychiatric disorders. Um, arachnophobia, famous one, fear of spiders, right? Ag agoraphobia, fear of crowds, among other things. I, I I know a few big words, and I'm not going to throw them all at you tonight, but those those are those are kind of famous ones. Um, so fear causes anxiety. Uh, and then I think a really important one for us to understand um, in our lives is that insecurity. And you might say, well, fear and insecurity are the same thing. The, the, they're not exactly the same thing. Uh, and we should um, give each other grace in terms of how we use language because language overlaps a great deal, particularly in this area, which is described by a lot of people. So uh, fear, I think, is um, uh, anxiety about something that's, um, that's real. Uh, so I'm afraid because I hear somebody trying to break into my house. Uh, anxiety probably could better be described as something that we're afraid of that's in the future, something that's not yet here. So an insecurity is, is an anxiety more than a fear. We, and we are insecure about all kinds of things. Um, whether our finances are going to hold for the future or whether they're good enough, we're insecure about our safety oftentimes. Uh, and particularly in uh, this uh, cor coronavirus season, fear about our health going um, the wrong, going sideways, 
uh, we're, we're afraid of accidents, uh, traumas that may come our way. So there's all, all manner of things that bring us insecurities, even um, separation from people that we love and that we depend on. So, so fear and insecurity are two of the major causes of anxieties in our lives. Um, I'm, I'm not a doctor and don't play one on TV. Uh, but I do know this, there are, and, I, and I did look some things up on a couple of websites, so symptoms of anxiety. So you may be saying to yourself, how do I know I'm anxious, Gino? Good question. One would be an inability to relax. If you're wound too tight all the time, uh, you're probably suffering from some uh, version of anxiety, maybe even an anxiety di disorder. If you can't relax, and so that leads to um, sleep disorders. So if you're, if you're anxious, highly anxious, and is keeping you from sleeping at night, then you're, you're in some trouble there. Um, I talked earlier about panic attacks and so panic disorders are uh, uh, caused by excessive anxiety, uh, phobias of various kind, and then you, the, cla the classic term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, traumas come into our lives. You, the, the, the number one cause for PTSD in the United States is not young men going off to war, it's car accidents. Car accidents cause PT, more PTSD in the US than anything else. So if you've been in a car accident or some traumatic thing has occurred to you, uh, it, it impacts your life and can cause you to, to walk in uh, anxiety. Then there are uh, psych psychiatric term, obsessive compulsive disorders. These are symptoms all of high anxiety. And here is a, um, um, a paragraph from the uh, healthline.com website, which is simple, simple um, down to earth um, uh, conversation about health. Healthline.com, anxiety is your body's natural response to stress. It's a feeling of fear or apprehension about what's to come. The first day of school, going to a job interview or giving a speech may cause most people to feel fearful and nervous. But if your feelings of anxiety are extreme, last longer than six months, and are interfering with your life, you may have an anxiety disorder. So I found that helpful because it, the, this paragraph went from what is just plain old anxiety to an, to an anxiety disorder. And you saw that it said, if, there, if your feelings of anxiety are extreme, which means they take over your life in an uncontrollable way, that'd be post-traumatic stress kind of thing. If they're extreme, they last longer than six months, or they're inter and and excuse me and they are interfering with your life. You may have an anxiety disorder. So and, and interfering with your life can include things like not being able to sleep. All right. So that's that's all, basically all the definitional stuff I'm going to give about anxiety. Does anybody want to add something else to that? I was hoping we'd get Nisha here, who's a, a psych, psychologist person, but I don't have her here. So anybody want to add to that? Maybe not. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on. So here's one thing that 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 makes the conversation, in my opinion, a little more complex, but uh, vastly uh, more interesting. Uh, not all anxiety is bad. I th I think that God has designed us to feel tension or to feel anxiety. You say, well, what do you mean by that? So uh, many of you heard the term fight or flight, the fight or flight reflex, the um, the part of our brain. It causes us to go into action when we're, when we're afraid or experiencing some sort of um, situation that makes us very, very wary. So um, stress, the tension and stress of that moment releases various uh, chemicals in our body to help us move quicker, to, to uh, be more aware of our surroundings, uh, to think um, perhaps uh, more quickly. So makes us more alert to danger, uh, helps to prepare us to take um, needed steps and to be at our best, uh, to have uh, a heightened awareness. The other thing about anxiety is it helps us to do something really well. So like tonight, I have some anxiety because I want to do this well. Uh, so, it, but it is, it is causing me to skip a beat every now and then, but, it, but I am uh, up for this event. I am, uh, it would be true every time I preach on Sunday. Uh, I, when I step up there, I'm, I'm trying to deliver something, do something I worked on for a while, do my best. And I do have um, what I think are appropriate, an appropriate level of stage. Um, what's the term I'm looking for? Stage fright or nervousness. But I, but I think that's all intended uh, on God's part to get us moving from a, a sluggish place 
to a, a place of high activity. So, so I think um, not all anxiety is bad, not all tension is bad, uh, but it's a terrible thing that takes over our lives, which I think is what our, our friends in the psychological community are talking about. Okay. I'm going, going to move pretty quickly into uh, two or three texts. Hey, Joe, good to see you, dog. Hey there. It's good to see you. <laughs> you look like a radio personality with those earmuffs, man. <laughs> yeah, I went. <laughs> That's, thank you. Yeah. Right. So uh, are there any, any other comments people want to make about anxiety or tension or stress or trauma? Anything? I haven't related anything to the coronavirus season or anything like that. Anybody have any comments about that? Good to see you, Kevin. Uh, um, uh, so with anxiety um, or stress, like one of the reactions that I have reading through, like especially the end of Matthew 6 and other places, is this double thing where it's kind of like, what's wrong with you that you have anxiety? What's right. wrong that you're anxious about this? Um, you know, I, I like a lot of a lot of the wording there is in the imperative, um, and so I kind of get anxious and guilty and anxious and guilty. I, I mean, I know that there's so anyhow. I know that, that there's much more to it than that. Sure, but that's so. Can I ask you question. when you read through that and you say, "What's wrong with you?" Do you feel some condemnation because you do feel anxious from time to time? Is that what you're saying? It might yes. Be, right. Yes. All right. Exactly. All right. So we'll try to deal with that. Uh, and you know, I, I have something, Gino, and I and you know me so well. Okay, you've Sharon. worked with me. Yes, you've worked with me for a long time. Right. And you know how I am. So, like, when you request something, one of my anxieties is how fast can I get this out? And you end up saying to me before I even do what you requested, Sharon, I'm in no hurry. <laughs> You know, but I do, I do struggle, and you know that about me. In terms of, it's I guess it's like a wanting to please anxiety type of thing. Okay. You know where I I, I kind of like right. stress going overboard, <laughs> right. Right. Try, trying to get something done. So no, I do that. I do struggle with that. Yes. I appreciate you um, uh, telling us all those things. Uh, so I, I, there's one thing I haven't said yet that I probably should say. Every one of us um, has different, we have different stressors, things that cause, cause us anxiety. And all of us have um, um, experiences in life that have molded us and shaped us. And so um, the things that push my buttons may not push your buttons. Um, uh, so I, I think... I think it's very wise for us to keep in mind that our reaction to stressors are very, very, very individualized. And so there's no, there won't be any one size fits all kind of a thing that we're going to talk about tonight. Basically, I'm going to look at the major text, talk about what Jesus is saying and offer some things. But, but as much as anything tonight, I wonder us as a community to talk to one another. Will this help? So I want you to be thinking, this helps me a lot. When I do these things, I find um, I can move from a place of anxiety to a place of less anxiety. Um, so, so that's kind of why I want to do this in a, a conversational format. Okay, so now that we have a number of people here, I want to say again that this is, in fact, being recorded. And I will, um, my intent is to put this up on the Hope Chapel a YouTube channel for people to observe uh, whenever they whenever they wish. So again, I want to say that this is being recorded. And I want to be fair about that. Okay, so let's move. Um, Joe, Joe talked, already brought up the classic text on anxiety, which is Jesus in Matthew 6. I'm going to read Matthew 6, verses 19 through 34. This is something you've all been uh, taught many times, I think. And I want to read the text and then make some comments about it uh, as we move forward. Here we go, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And there are a couple of pithy, pithy sayings here 
And that's the first one. Uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, non-intuitive. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You might, might think that, well, Jesus, maybe he should have said where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But that's not what he said. Where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Okay, so, so lay up treasures in heaven and not so much on earth. Okay, so that's the, the first part of the text. And we will continue. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I'm going to pause here and say that, again, that's something that doesn't seem to be intuitive. Why would Jesus talk about treasures on earth and treasures in heaven and then turn and talk about the lamp of the body is the eye and the darkness, blah, blah. What, what in the world, Jesus? Can't you stay on track? So um, I believe it fits right in. And um, uh, I'll come back to that and explain what I think it means. Um, uh, but uh, so we'll leave it there. Okay. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And then the ne very next thing, no one can serve two masters, verse 24, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then a second pithy saying, you cannot serve God and money. First saying, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then you cannot serve God in money. This is axiomatic. It's very clear. There's no, well, maybe you can serve money a little bit. There's, it's not in there at all. You either serve one or the other. And then the longer text beginning in Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So don't be anxious. Uh, think about the birds, and then don't be anxious. Um, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? So, so aren't, the, aren't the birds more, more valuable? Aren't the birds of some value? The birds who are of some value, aren't you more value than they to God? Yes. And then the question, how can anxiety add a single hour to your, why, why worry? You can't, doesn't help you in any way. And then verse 28, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. So consider the birds. Consider the flowers. Anxiety is not going to add to your life. Jesus is, is saying some stuff here. And then he goes on. Therefore, do not be anxious, which I think is the third time he said that in this, in this paragraph. Do, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? All of which are legitimate needs. That's the thing that we've got to understand. They're not illegitimate. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first, <coughs> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So this will be the third, what I'm going to call uh, the third pithy saying. Seek first the kingdom of God. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. You can't serve God in money. And then seek first the kingdom. And then therefore... Verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And this is where the idea, it's not original with me, but the idea of anxiety being tied to the future, something that we're afraid of that's going to happen, and then um, fear being tied to something that is happening. So again, these terms overlap. Yes. All right. So um, I have... Um, okay, Kevin, I'll get back to your question about what Jesus is responding to in just a second, all right? So there's a, okay, I'll have to, I'll have to look it up. So what he, there was before, before he started on this text, he was talking, I believe, about uh, prayer in Matthew chapter 6. So if you, you look that up and tell me, I believe it was the Lord's Prayer before this. Um, okay, so there are a couple things I want to say. First of all, in 620, um, uh, it's, he says, um, don't lay up, he said, 
lay up treasures in heaven. And then in verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. I think these ideas flow together. I, don't, I, I think this uh, entire text is about um, where, we're, where we're paying attention in our lives. Um, so, so the question would be, in, in terms of laying up treasure in heaven, to think about what it is actually that is treasure, what is really valuable in this life. And so there, there are two things, I think, that we can point to for, that everyone would consider to be of high value. One is time. Um, how do we spend our time? It's, it's, it is, um, it is a, uh, an asset that has limited duration. Can, can I say that? Limited duration, because we're going to die. And so we should make good use of the time that we have. And the closer I get to the end of my days, I realize, wow, this is... This, this deal is running out on me and uh, it, it's going to be here. Gonna, the end's going to be here pretty soon, sooner than I wish, probably. Uh, so time is very precious to me, becoming more precious. So time, I think, is, is of extreme value to us. And then the second thing would be, uh, as here, money, whatever it is um, that, that holds value, money, jewels, whatever, property. So, so the question is, um, I think Jesus raised the question, what do you spend your time on? Where, do, where does your time go? And then where do your resources go, your, your, your money? So just look at your personal calendar and your checkbook. And or if I were to look at it, I could tell you, well, these things are really important to you. You spend a lot of money on food. You spend a lot of time with your wife. Uh, these things are important to you. And that's how we measure what's really valuable to us. Not what we say with our words, but how we actually spend our assets. We don't spend precious assets on things that are, that are invaluable. I mean, that are, that are not valuable to us. So I think Jesus is saying, hey, value the things that are spiritual. Make, make some decisions to spend assets on, uh, on heaven. Lay up treasure in heaven. Uh, and then um, invest your time in spiritual matters and invest your money. So, so what do you mean by that? How do we do that? Well, um, I think we invest our time uh, by being good students of the Scripture, by wasting wasting our time in prayer i mean it's like what do you what do you christian people doing over there talking to god all the time it's not even there it's a big waste of time that's literally what i thought before i became a christian it seemed like a huge and i heard uh, i read i actually didn't, didn't hear read one time uh my favorite uh, whipping boy bill gates i uh, taught he married a, a nice catholic girl and uh w went to mass a few times and then decided he didn't need to go to mass anymore because and this is what was in the in Time magazine. It seemed like a, a very inefficient use of time. And that, was, <laughs> that was really funny. But I thought to the point. I thought, yeah, that's what that's what you would think if um, if you're a busy busy business guy making millions and millions of dollars, and to go sit and listen to some priest somewhere go on about the Bible, that would certainly seem to be an inefficient use of time. So I think that's how the world looks at Christian spiritual practice. But Jesus Jesus says. Spend your asset on heaven. Lay up treasure in heaven. I think we, we do that by um, serving, worshiping, and uh, doing Bible study. Those are two ways we spend our time well. Of course, you could, you could add to that list, and I'm asking you to add to that list and tell me how you spend your time. Uh, I would think time spent with um, um, people who can't give back, uh, children, um, the sick, uh, maybe homeless people, where you're doing ministry to people. Um, I think that is time where we lay up treasure in heaven. Okay, and then I think uh, we invest our resources in, in heaven. Lay up treasure in heaven also means resources. Come on, Gino. How, how can you spend money on heaven? What's, what's this money on spiritual things? Okay, here are some suggestions for what that might mean. Um, maybe it means to, to give away stuff in a sacrificial way. Uh, something I, I teach all the time about, about money. It's things that we really value so that money so that money and things do not become an idol. I think it's a good practice to take something that's valuable to you and just give it away to somebody, and even to somebody who may not understand the value of it. Just give it away. The main thing is to get it out of your life so that you're not holding on to it improperly. I think that's an investment in heaven. Um, I think supporting people who go onto the mission field, that's an investment in heaven. That's an easy one. That's like, like a no-brainer. Um, giving to your, your local church or giving to other ministries, certainly that's a no-brainer also. Uh, I would also add this one. Uh, any, time, any, any money you spend preparing yourself for ministry, maybe you do a, a correspondence course or uh, some, some, in some way you spend money 
to maybe buy um, a Bible um, commentary or a dictionary or something. I think that's money well spent uh, in self-preparation and self um, helping yourself become a better minister. I think that's good money spent. And so there may be other ways, and you, and you can think of maybe better things than that. So Jesus said, invest in, in heaven. He said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So what is it that's really important? Let's, let's invest in that. Okay. And then he gives a warning. The eye is the lamp of the body. And this is where I talked about this earlier. What? Come on, Jesus. What do you... Did you go out of your mind? The eyes, the lamp of the body. If your eyes healthy, your body will be full. But your eyes bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So that's wedged in between. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Don't lay it up on earth, but lay it up in heaven. And then no one can serve two masters. So lay up treasures in heaven. No one can serve two masters. And in between the warning about the lamp of the body being the eye. And if the, if the lamp is dark, right? If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Okay, so here's what I think Jesus is doing. I don't think he went out of his mind. I don't think he took a circuitous route around something. I think he is saying these ideas are really, really, really important. If we don't have our gaze fixed on the right things, if we're not treasuring the things of heaven above the things of earth, then we, we are, in, in essence, already off course. We're aimed at the wrong thing, and we're, we're going to get worse. Our course is going to become ever, ever more um, distinct or different from where, what it should be. It will become a wider and wider and wider gap. Um, and so it's really important that, we, that our direction is clear and our eye is clear and i think that's what jesus is saying because if it's if it's not clear it will only become cloudier and cloudier and cloudier the further away we get from our target so i think that's what he's saying um it's a very colorful saying um if the light in you is darkness how great is the darkness and and uh so i think that's what he's saying anybody want to add to that anybody have any other thoughts along those lines Okay, so this is a quiet group today. I'm happy for that, I think, <laughs> at least for a while. Okay, so, um, so I'm almost done with this part of the, of the talk. So then he, he goes from the lamp, eyes, lamp of the body, etc., uh, and saying you can't serve two masters, which is a, just a, a lovely, short, pithy, beautiful saying. You, ju you just can't do it. You can't do it. If you're mastered by money, you are not going to serve God. If you're serving God, you won't be mastered by money. So that's the end of the day. That's how it is. Um, and more than one person has set out and, to, and said to himself or herself, I'm not going to be mastered by money. And lo and behold, we find ourselves idolaters by the end of our life. So it's really important where we end. Okay. He says, God clothes the field with beauty, clothes the field with beauty, and feeds the birds and cares for you and me. Um, so I think here he's beginning to directly address the anxiety, the normal, everyday anxieties of our lives. Food, clothing, uh, some things to eat, things to drink, things to wear. Um, and he says, um, look around you. And so this would be our first clue. Look around you. Doesn't God take care of the birds? He loves you more. You're more valuable to God than the birds. Look at how well he takes care of them. He's feeding the birds. And look at the field. Aren't you more important to God? Aren't you more important than a flower? And look at these beautiful flowers that clothe the field. So, so he, it's, not, it's really not appeal to natural law or to nature. He's just saying, look around you, and can you not see that God is good? If he's good, then surely he will take care of you. That's the so Jesus moving from one play, one um, object, moving from observation to uh, an idea. God is good; He's taking care of these uh, this part of His earth. Surely He will take care of you as well. God is full of grace, and He's and He's generous. Look at His generous nature. You can trust Him. You can trust Him to uphold you in trying times. Uh, and then I think um, He goes on to say this, something like this. Um, concentrate on today and not tomorrow. That was toward the end where he said, um, uh, let's see, I'll get it here. Somebody have it? 
sufficient is been like sufficient for the day is right that's what i'm looking for yeah it's the very end uh anxiety don't be anxious about tomorrow tomorrow will be anxious for itself sufficient is the day for its own trouble that's what i was looking for so this is also a clue to i think the, uh, a clue from jesus to uh how to not become anxious or to become less anxious he said just concentrate on today don't pick up tomorrow's troubles tomorrow's got its own set of troubles wait until you get there but um i I've been around a lot of anxious people in my day, and I can tell you for sure that uh, they um, anxiety. What anxiety drives us to is to worry about many, many things, and many things that are that are in the future that are yet to come. Um, I may not. I may not. Um, well, I, I, I could give examples. I don't want to, because I think it's easily understood. Anxiety is reaching out and grabbing the trouble of the future and bringing it into my bosom for today, and I think. So the way not the way to lessen our anxiety is to say, I'm not going to pick that up until I get there. When I get there, I'll pick it up. But today, I'm not going to pick it up. I'm not going to worry about it. You think, well, that's Alfred E. Newman, What Me Worry in Mad Magazine. No, it's it's a it's a form of sanity. And Jesus encouraged it. Um, okay. So so here are a couple of uh, practical things. One would be we can make a list today of God's goodness around us. God's goodness in the life of maybe your spouse or maybe your children. I mean, you know, if you're if you're a gloomy Eeyore kind of a person, you may God's not doing anything good for me. That's a, I'm not I'm not even saying you got you've got to see good things in your life. You may not, but think about people around you. What what is God? And so this is why we uh, as Christians we give testimony to what God has done or what, what we see God doing around us, because because it helps us begin to believe that God is actually good. And that's the, that's the thing that Jesus is trying to say. He is good in his character. He is good and he is kind and he is generous. Look what he's done for person X. Look what he's done over here um, for your spouse or your children or some such thing as that. Well, okay, he's good to other people. All right, maybe maybe he can be good to me. So that's one thing. Uh, so so let's make a list. We can make a list of God's goodness. And another thing that making the list will do, uh, dear anxious ones, is when you when you make a list, it forces you to think about something besides your anxieties. So do the chore. Open your journal. Write it down. Make a list of God's goodness around you. Just what you can observe. That's what Jesus said. Look around you. And so let's look around and uh, and make a list. Uh, and then it helps to change where we're focused. Uh, let's see. All right. So um, I want to add to this uh, idea. The text out of Luke 10, verse 38 through 42. And I don't need to go there. This is the story of Mary and Martha. You remember that Jesus came to their house and uh, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was bothered by the fact that G Mary wasn't helping her do all the good things that um, that hospitality requires. And they're, they're legitimate things. That's the thing. The thing to really understand about anxiety, the things that we're anxious about are in fact very legitimate. It's not... It's not an illegitimate thing to be anxious. Uh, it, it may be a dangerous thing or difficult thing to have our lives taken over by anxiety, but just having some anxiety is never is not condemned. I don't think Jesus ever condemns that. He says, just don't, don't allow it to take over your life. So um, Martha's bothered. She comes to Jesus and said, hey, basically, in a nutshell, tell Mary to help me do the, the hospitable things because you're our guest. Mary's not helping me. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to take away the thing from Mary. She, said that she, has, she has come to understand what is of primary importance, and that is to sit at my feet. So um, this whole thing about um, what's, what's the most important thing uh, in life, making a list of God's goodness, change what, where our focus is. Jesus says, focus on me. Spend time um, intentionally, purposefully, Focusing on me. And so I, this is where if, if you're a um, follower of Richard Foster or others, spiritual disciplines come into play. That's the point of the spiritual disciplines is to help us focus, whether it's <clears throat> the discipline of silence, which is a difficult one for me, or uh, fasting, um, um, uh, some kind of um, um, disciplined Bible reading or Bible study or prayer, praying with others, praying by yourself. Even so, even something as simple as taking a walk, and taking a walk in silence and enjoying the enjoying the outdoors, these things are intended to move our focus away from the things that are, makes us anxious 
enter onto God. And so, so the, the, the uh, practice is to change our focus. And, and how we get there, we can get there by different things. Jesus said, Mary's focused in the right way. I'm not going to have her move. So that's what was happening in Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> so perhaps we should say, ask the question, where's my focus? Where's my focus? Are you, are you all familiar with the, what I consider a pretty modern term of soaking, soaking, listening to music or listening to the Bible um, read on tape or listening to a good Christian book? Soaking, and, and, and I think it, to soak in, in a Christian, Christian culture or the Bible, um, meditating on Christ can help us, again, to change our focus. So I think that my son introduced me to the term, and he just, I, was, I said, what are you doing? I'm, I'm soaking. I said, what? You in the tub? No. I'm listening to, and he was listening to Lecrae. It was Lecrae, some rapper guy. Do you know who that is, Evan? Okay, so do you know who that you will? You look like you, you're like the cat that can see. So you know, you know Lecrae. All right, okay. Anyway, so I thought, all right, that's interesting. So what's our focus? So maybe it's time for us to soak in some things. And, I, and those, for me, the change of focus comes in the spiritual disciplines. And, and again, my favorite book on the spiritual disciplines is Richard Foster. Um, <laughs> no, it's not the spirit of the disciplines. Is Dallas Willard. Richard Foster wrote, you can look it up. Richard Foster's book on the spiritual disciplines. It'll, it'll come to me after a while. All right, so I want to finish with this. Say it again, Lynette. Celebration of discipline. Celebration of discipline. Richard Foster. It's now probably 30, 35 years old. A celebration of discipline. Still the best book in my opinion. Okay, so the last text I want to look at is Philippians uh, verse uh, 4 through 7. This is, uh, again, a classic text. Um, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Okay? Um, the Lord is at hand. Yeah, that's right. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. So there's the imperative. Do not be anxious about anything. This is Paul to the Philippian church. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, and this is the promise, so that was the practice, here's the promise, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Okay. So I've been talking to almost 45 minutes, 35 minutes. All right, so let me walk through this very carefully. So he says, don't be anxious about anything. Again, I told you that was an imperative, it was a command. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So those three words go together. Prayer and supplication are synonyms. Um, supplication means to come with, um, uh, with a need. Prayer means to uh, offer uh, worship, basically, to talk to God. But it means more than that. It means to honor God, to worship God. Supplication means to ask for things. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Um, and thanksgiving, uh, one um, scholar wrote, is grateful acknowledgement of past mercies. Here it doesn't mean to thank God for the things he's going to give us. This word is looking back and saying, God, thank you for the way you've already been merciful in my life. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Actually, I could say prayer and supplication with gratefulness. I'm grateful for the way you've already treated me. Thank you, God. Bring your stuff to God. Let your request be made known to God. So, so the question is, are we, um, are we actually doing that? Uh, that's, sometimes I wonder if people are actually praying when they're, when they're walking uh, in, in anxiety, high degree of anxiety. Um, so here's what I would offer as a way to um, help you with that. Excuse me for just a second. One way to make sure that we're praying is to keep a journal of prayers, a journal of prayers, which is, um, for me, I've, I've done this for lots of years, and uh, if I'm uh, facing a really difficult issue or series of issues, I just begin to, I begin to write the issue down. I'll write the thing down that's really troubling me. Lord, and sometimes I'll turn to prayer, Lord, you know that I'm really, I'm really upset about blah, 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 and, I, and I'm really having a tough time trusting you for this because 
I feel like you let me down already. I'm disappointed in you. And I just lay, I just laid out, laid all out there, uh, bad attitudes and all. And, and uh, it, I think that's helpful because then I can go back and examine my own heart by examining my words. So I think I really encourage you to write stuff down and then, and then just begin to ask for what you want, but write it down, write it down. And then you can go back and say, maybe three weeks later and say, oh, this is how God answered that. And it won't be, at least not for me. Um, whatever I ask for, it's not really typical that I get exactly what I asked for, but I get oftentimes what I realize later is better or what I really needed, what I really should have asked for. So I, I'm really big on, on writing stuff down. So prayer and supplication with thanksgiving uh, that's the action and attitude we should have as we approach God. So there's something that needs to be happening in our heart. And then let your requests be made known to God and, and actually do that. Let them be, and I would say write them down. So here's, a, here's something that I want, to add, I want to add to this. It may be that you don't feel thankful and you don't feel grateful. In fact, you just may be angry, may be irritated. Please lift, let your requests be made known to God. Don't, don't not come to God because you're angry. I think uh, he can handle it. I promise you he can handle it. Uh, but we'll, what we want to do is we want to get to the place where we can offer our prayers and our supplications with thanksgiving. And so I think that's uh, as goal as much as, uh, as anything else. And then, he, then the promise. So that's the practice and the promise, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, which means it's beyond reason or superior to reason, not that it's illogical. Some people say, oh, um, Peace of God is goes against logic. Well, that's not true. It's just beyond our reason. It's, it's superior to reason. I don't know, perhaps we've experienced all that, or all of us have experienced it. Then it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And many of you know this. This word guard is a reference, or it's a word that is used in other places to describe what soldiers do near the near the gate of a city. They they are careful about letting people in and out of the city. Um, and so he says the peace of God acts in this way guards our hearts and minds. And um, man, I, I have been, I have been around a lot of people that, that, are, that struggle with uh, fears, anxieties. And I can tell you that the gate of their mind or the, and the gate of their heart is not guarded by peace. And so um, I think the apostles' words are very, very colorful, very strong in his promise is very important. Come to God, bring your stuff, bring your supplications, bring your prayers, bring it with as much gratitude as you can muster, and then let him know what's on your heart. And I think this, this is the, there's an unburdening of the soul, an unburdening um, that comes in confession, maybe, as much as anything, that um, uh, puts us in the place where we can let go of those things and quit trying to control the outcome and allow God to give us his peace and let him control the outcome. And there's a, there's a, there's a, what I just described is an enormous exchange uh, that maybe we don't have time to, to walk through today, but I think his, Paul's, I'll give you this text because I think Paul's words move us in that direction, but that's a huge thing that I, I just said there. So, um, one, one, uh, let me I'll end with this. One uh, writer said, the meaning of this phrase, um, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, means, uh, means that when we send our requests, then the peace of God shows up on guard duty, which I thought was pretty cool. We send up our requests, then the peace of God shows up on guard duty. I think that's a good way to do that. So I, I've suggested a number of things here to help us with anxiety. I think that they come out of the scriptures as I, as I read the scriptures. So um, let me ask you this. How do you deal with anxiety when you face it in your life? So, so try to talk one at a time. Un unmute yourself and, and answer the question. How do you deal with anxiety? What do you do when you're anxious in your life? Well, I think that for me, a lot of the way I handle anxiety now comes out of experience from um, how did I experience it in the past and what helped. Um, about 15 years ago, I went through a really, really difficult time, um, a pretty serious depression and anxiety. 
And um, some of those things that you mentioned, the, the being able to focus on God's goodness um, was really, really important. Um, Psalm 103 was recommended to me as something to meditate on. And I would keep that in a place where I could see it and read through it multiple times every day. So like rehearsing God's goodness. Um, and that helped a lot. Um, in my particular case, it turned out there was a chemical imbalance that needed to be um, taken care of with short-term medication. But the, um, that rehearsing of God's goodness, even when I couldn't necessarily see it in my own life, but seeing it in scripture um, was tremendously important. Um, and really, I think, kept me from going completely overboard. <laughs> um, and now, because I have been through that, when things come up that tend to make me anxious, I'm able to look back on God's goodness, and see how he brought me through it, and practice those same things again. Thank you very much, Lynette. Um, would somebody else be willing to share and help us all? So Lynette, what, what in Psalm 103 did you find most comforting or um, not, not like particular passages, but in general at the time? Well, you know, it specifically talks about his benefits and um, how he forgives sins, heals our diseases, redeems our life from the pit. Um, and it also deals with how far he's removed our sins from us. And part of what I was dealing with at that point in time was um, my, my assurance of salvation had been shaken because of bad teaching. And so to go back and rehearse that and hear that and read it over and over again helped seem it in my head and in my heart that Indeed, I was secure. Thanks. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, uh, I don't know fully how on point this is, but uh, uh, so I, I could jokingly say first, we go to the doctor and get some pills. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, Martha and I uh, like to listen to worship music, just kind of sit and listen to it. The third thing is uh, uh, we pull up the Uversion app on our phones, and it's found sort of interesting that if you listen to the audible version uh, in a translation that's different from the written one, so we, you know, play the, play the audible reading of a, of a scripture passage, daily reading, but read it in a different translation kind of focuses the mind a little bit because you're kind of noticing a little bit of variation between the two. And uh, I guess the third thing is, uh, uh, you know, read a book and watch a British mystery. <laughs> yeah, man, the BBC's got some stuff. I'm writing that down. I thought that was good. You actually gave us four things there, brother, unless I missed you. Go to the doctor and get some pills. Listen, soak up some worship music. Listen to the Bible in a different translation and then read the book or watch translation and then watch your book. So, yeah. So, Sharon? Yeah, I, I just, I just, can y'all hear me? Yes. I, I just wanted to kind of relate to what Lynette was saying um, back a few years well, several years ago, this is before my husband passed away, I was diagnosed with cancer and went through all the tests and they knew what position it was in and uh, I, they were going to try to remove what they could in a surgical procedure. So when, so when I was going through all that, meeting with all the doctors and all the people, I, was, I remembered a little a song it, when I was a young, younger person and it was on Psalms 27. And I would sing the song and meditate on that. 
over and over and over again through every doctor's visit, every uh, test and stuff that they were running before they scheduled me for uh, the, the surgery. And then all of a sudden, God spoke to me right on this surgical table and said, they're not going to find it. It's not in the two o'clock position because I healed you. <laughs> wow. True story. And I got my paperwork. But I can remember just, I don't know what it was about that song, you know, uh, that I could, it was Psalms 20, you know, some trust in horses and some chariots. I would just sing it over and over. And that's how I meditated was through worship. Great. And, Thank you. It's, it's one of those things where it um, changed your focus, right? That'd be yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I think changing the focus is really important. And this, uh, that's also basically what. I think Jim said also with the worship music and such. Anybody else to add to the conversation? This is probably the best part of the whole the whole time together. While you're thinking, I can tell you PJ PJ's on the line and I, and I can tell you for sure. The most difficult thing for us was when uh, we came to a place where we realized we couldn't, we were not going to have children naturally and uh, kind of, had to let go of that after several years of um, medical procedures and counseling and that sort of thing. And it was a really, really difficult, really difficult breaking time. Um, and, and for us, one of the things that got us through that was that, hi, Martha, was that we just had each other. So I, I think um, one of the things that helps us in, uh, one of the things that helps us in, uh, is to is to uh, have somebody to, close to us to, uh, in uh, share to and lean, and share our cult and lean uh, share our experience cult, uh, uh, and lean on that person. So yes, we did. Lean on that person. What's been suggested? Yes, we listened to music and we read the Bible, but, to music, but it was it was us going through it together it was, that was us going through us together, together, that uh, immensely. Immensely. I want to add that as something that's helpful. I want to add that as something that's helpful. I think that's uh, go ahead. That that's go ahead. That's true. Or, or, or I I um uh, I relate I relate to that the this, you know the body of Christ oh the body of Christ being able to uh, you know have have somebody pray with you and just 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 being able to have somebody yeah uh, that you know loves you and. And especially neat when when it's somebody who's walked in that place before, whether or not they're walking with you right then, and it, it, you know that. I mean, that's terrific. I mean, if, if, if it's somebody who's had a similar experience, and and uh, you know, you, you don't feel. I don't. They kind of read you. You know, they they hear you, and. Um, yeah, the, when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, um, I was terrified, just terrified, and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really know anybody that had it. But Cindy Bybee's daddy had, you know, had had, had passed away. But he, he we we'd prayed for him for years. Cindy and I and, and Babs prayed together for years, and uh, and we'd pray for Cindy's daddy. So it was kind of like a, I don't know, like a steadying place. Like Cindy understands, and it, yeah. So you found it very helpful to have someone down in the down in the hole with you, right? That understood. Yeah. Right. Yep. And. You know, and then there were there were people, other people at church that prayed for me and everything. That yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not discounting that any any at all. Um, sort of, I'll jump to another. Do you have time for all this? Yeah. Jump to another area. Uh, uh, one time when I was probably one of the most afraid I've ever been was you know that was before I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, but I was in school. Uh, Way past, way past my due date, you know. I was, I was, I was in my late fifties, and uh, I realized real fast I was in way, way, way over my head. I like the first day, and I and I 
couldn't really drop out. I mean, I wanted, I wanted to run. That's always been my, my, um, my first, my first uh, instinct was just to bail out, run, 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 and get away from this. But, I, but I didn't feel like I could, and it wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, anyway, I, I couldn't, wouldn't. I would go out to my car at breaks, and I, I had some scriptures that that I'd uh, printed out, typed up, and. And, and I had them in the plastic sleeves in my notebook, and I would get them out and look at them and just read through them. And, and one of them was Psalm 91, and I, I learned all these when I was uh, young, and uh, it was in, in King James. Especially the Psalms in King James are really kind of neat if they're, you know, if it's not too obscure. Yeah. And Psalm 91 is, yeah. uh, you know, he, 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 um, he abides in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, let's see, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge, my God in whom I trust. And, and it goes on, you know, he will uh, uh, you know, protect you from the fowler snare and all that stuff. And, and under his wings shalt thou trust. And it, and it sounds like a, it's not, it's not, a, it's a, like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And you don't have to worry about it at all. Shout thou trust. You will, by God's power, you will be able to trust me while I have have my God wings over you. And I, I just rest in that one particular little phrase, shout thou trust. And that's carried me through lots and lots and lots of other things too. Like, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Being under God's wings just really, oh, it speaks to my heart. Yeah. And shout thou trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, yeah, something, you know, a much lesser thing in a sense is it's I'm, I really, really, really hate MRIs. I, oh, yeah. I, I never in thought I was claustrophobic until well, MRIs. Yeah. I, and I've had to have a lot of them with, uh, with Parkinson's. And, I uh, and and I would hook my hook my thumbs in the in the pockets of my jeans and close my eyes and 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 recite psalms in my head, it, it, having my eyes closed so you can't see how little that place is that you're in, and, and recite you know that's kind of you know simplistic little tips but uh, no no this very excellent mark oh, trust shout thou trust shout thou trust and don't I, don't tell me you have gum in your mouth cuz they they'll take your gum away from you and the gum keeps my my mouth moist yeah. so i park it on my teeth uh, and and I, <laughs> and I don't tell them i have gum in my mouth cuz you, you know you're not supposed to move or chew or anything so uh, anyway yeah thank you that's Martha. that's my stuff no no shout thou good. trust very good really good um Somebody else, if somebody, I have a couple things that somebody else is, uh, unless somebody else is ready to share. Yeah, I just, this is Mandy. Okay, so, Mandy. Not Ma- Mandy, not Matt. Mandy, not Matt. I can really relate to what Martha was saying about finding someone who's walking with you through possibly the same kinds of things. And I think the theme in that is that the person who's walking with you can can acknowledge that suffering happens, you know? That's good. Where where a lot of times, like from an early age, right, we're told like, you can be whatever you want to be. Make yourself X, Y, and Z. But reality is that life is going to happen and we have no control over it. Like enter pandemic 2020, <laughs> like, you know? The, the thing about that is that I feel like Christ in scripture and the Lord, he becomes that, like his words so often say, I am with you in this, or like, I, you will not walk alone, you know, like, like she was saying, like, cover you with my wings, all these scriptures about how God is someone like in the suffering with us, like Christ on the cross, right? Like he's no stranger to suffering. So it's easy and not, it's easy for me anyway to like, I guess, look around and think, oh, life seems really good for that person over there. Well, you know, like, I guess life is just good. But 
honestly, like God is good. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's good. God says in this world, there will be suffering and it looks different for different people. But I just, sometimes I just feel like, man, I guess my response in anxiety to that is often when I think like, I should be having a different experience. Why is it like this? Instead of focusing on, um, this is just me personally, instead of focusing on how God is there with me and, and he will minister to me in it and provide me with the things I need. Um, even when like with my eyes, I can't really see how that's possible. Um, and yet, uh, I guess this is like a quote from, well, it's a quote from scripture, but someone once told me that Joanne Davis said, um, you know, God says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Mm -hmm. But no one day really felt like goodness and mercy. Um, and I feel like that's really true. Like for me, even, I mean, I'm not, I don't have like the crown of um, gray hair yet. <laughs> yet. It's coming. But even, even in my own life, I can see like, man, that sure didn't feel like goodness and mercy. But looking back, truly, Lord, like that was goodness and mercy in those, you know, really difficult times. Thank you, Mandy. Anybody else want to add to that? I, this, this has been, this has been the best part for me. Okay. I have some thoughts. Uh, first of all, there's a book I want to recommend to you and I recommend you do it on, get it on audible. If you, if you want to, it's the gold standard of uh, stress post-traumatic stress. It's called The Body Keeps Score. I'm not sure I could pronounce the author's name, but The Body Keeps Score. Um, uh, it was, uh, this is the doctor that uh, really um, broke open the field of uh, uh, post-traumatic stress therapies. And the, what he means by his title, The Body Keeps Score, is that um, God, has, God has made us in such a way that we retain in our in our physical body and as well as in our brains, the uh, our body's reaction to stress and to tension, and the the so sometimes it cripples people, but the the fortunate thing or the glorious thing about that is that we can get to the stress through physical activity. In other words, we can reduce stress in our lives caused by trauma or otherwise by uh, doing things that are uh, physical. And the, the, his book explains all that in much more detail than, than I'm going to today. But it does help to, to go to learn how to do square dancing. It does help uh, to take long walks. It does help to learn how to sing or to act in a play. It, all, those things, all those things that uh, are offered to us as therapies do actually work because our body is made in such a way that the body itself, uh, in his phrase, in his phraseology, keeps the score of our um, anxieties and the and the things that brought brought them about. So uh, I recommend the book. It's a long read. It's a difficult read, uh, but it's but it's much much more palatable on audiobook. The body keeps score. So we can do stuff, we can do stuff, physical stuff. Um, uh, so, so for example, um, Jim and Martha, you guys can hold hands and go for a short walk. Just hold, but hold hands. Don't just do the walk. So they're, they're literally, phys you know, a massage helps a lot. And, but it's because, our, because th they're, the, the way God's made us is that our bodies are engaged um, in the, the trauma. Um, so I appreciated also Mandy's word that someone walking with you can acknowledge your suffering. I think that's really, that was a good word, Mandy. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm, I'm also reminded, um, so these are just some things as we're going along here. I'm also reminded of um, Martha's, uh, the first time I heard her give her testimony about Parkinson's, she, she talked about the guy in Moby Dick, the, I don't remember his name, the sailor who had, <laughs> thank you, Jim. That's not what I meant. Um, the, the, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what to think about you, Jim. Um, uh, you have so distracted me, my brother. I'm going to have to do this to, to uh, get my thought back. Anyway, hold fast. 
the sailor. Who was the sailor, Martha? Because you, you talk about the sailor that had hold fast tattooed on his knuckles so he wouldn't get swept away when he was doing work. Who was that, Martha? Uh, I, was that? He may have had a name. I don't know. I don't think he was a real. Oh. It's been a long time since I saw that movie. I don't think oh. he was a real. Yeah, it was Master and Commander was the name of the movie. It was, oh, a, it was, it was that Moby Dick. It was um, Dick. Russell Crowe movie where he was a, some kind of big admiral or something. Uh-huh. And the, but the sailor, you know, was a, you know, was an old grizzled guy. That, uh, you know, but he he uh, held on to I don't know the wood at the bottom of the sail or something. I don't know anything about boats, but he you know he had it was kind of like uh, the Blues Brothers with things tattooed on their knuckles. Right. You know, I mean, I hate to. The distraction to he, and he had hold fast. hold fast and 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 he's you know when he, he said when he was afraid or whatever he was he was giving advice to a young sailor i think and he was saying you know that he had to hang on and that's what helped him hang on was that hold fast and so i i really relate to visual pictures and things like that so it, it you know I wanted to tattoo it on my knuckles but i didn't I was hoping you would because I would. Yeah, be good. Come on. Yeah. There's still time, Martha. What? There's still time. No, I don't you think so. Good. You don't think so? <laughs> uh, old, fast, and I don't think so. Okay. All right. Maybe, so, yeah. So I want to do. I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. So I have a couple more things and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up. It's uh, 740, 742. Um, so the first thing is this here's a text that um, is familiar to us, but I want to read its entirety. It's in First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 1 about the God of comfort. Uh, but it's what we've been talking about. And I was thinking of Mandy's uh, line about someone walking with you can acknowledge your suffering. I think that's really wonderful. And, or we, as we talked with Martha, somebody down in the hole with you is very helpful. So this is Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse, beginning verse 3. And I'll read down, uh, looks like I'll go all the way through verse 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. So that's, that's Martha saying, under his wing, hiding under the shadow of his wing, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He goes on from there. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, as Paul and the apostles. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also, you will also share in our comfort. So that's, I think that helps to summarize a number of things that have been said here today. Um, and Jim Davis, I, I think you're just a crazy, my brother. So I'm going to leave that alone. So as, as we conclude, as we conclude, um, I have one or two other things that I really wanted to talk about, but I'll be interested knowing from you all what topics you would like for us to tackle in this format. So what are some things you'd like for us to talk about? And if you don't think of, if you think of something later, you can send me a note, but I'd, I would like to hear from you now if you, if you have something on the top of your head, off the top of your head. Well, what about just like the broad category of uh providence and whether like the current uh, pandemic is something that is from God or is that something from Satan wow. or something altogether different from those categories. Okay, so the way I would tackle that is, does the Bible give us any direction on that? But I'm sure there are lots of opinions. I've seen, I've seen them in the news, that's for sure. Anything else? Did we ever speak to Whitney's, uh, Whitney, Whitney uh, gave a, a personal example of she, she dances before the Lord as a, as 
you know, a way to hang on. Anyway, I have just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I she, haven't heard that she didn't get ignored. Yeah, did she say that and I missed it? Did she say that and I missed it? Uh, it was on the, in the chat. It was in the chat. So, anyway, I just, yeah, I didn't know what the rules were or whatever. So, no, there, there's no rules. I just wanted to acknowledge Whitney's, Whitney's, uh, um, oh, there it is. I, I, didn't, input. I, I didn't scroll down far enough. I see it. Thank you, Whitney, for sending that in. I appreciate it. I like to dance. That helps me. That So that, that also speaks to my the book I was talking about, uh, The Body Keeps Score. And then we have to hold hands so, we don't, so one of us will not fall down. Oh, you're talking about you and Martha. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's rich. Yeah, I think um, um, I think it's true that the that God has put into our lives into into the way that the world really works many many ways to alleviate the anxieties I think anxiety and the, this um, the need to get get up for things and, and come back down from things I think that's a normal human experience a human life experience that it's helpful and God intended that way. And it, and it gets, it becomes um, difficult when our focus is on the wrong thing or when our trauma is to such an extent we can't, we can no longer relax. So, so uh, maybe, maybe I'll talk, maybe, maybe I need to talk a little bit about Sabbath because Sabbath is God's uh, answer to work, work, work. So maybe I'll do that one time. We can talk about Sabbath, the meaning of Sabbath. God's a God of rest as well as the God of work God and tension, God of anxiety. Okay, so let me offer a prayer and we'll be done for the evening. I thank you all for your engagement. Uh, it's, been, it's been for me an interesting time. So, so uh, give me some feedback later if you want to send me a note or a text. Um, we've done about what I hoped we would do. I, I heard from you, your great stories. We looked at the scripture a little bit. I tried to define the issue a little bit. Um, and I think this is the best way to talk about stuff together. So, Father in heaven, we're grateful. Father in heaven, we're grateful for your for your work in our in our as a community and us as individuals, as couples, as families. Uh, we're grateful for your presence among us, your presence here, Lord, in this. Um, a little bit unusual circumstance of being sheltered in place and talking to each other in a video conference. But Lord, we, we have a, I have received encouragement tonight that we have received encouragement from the body. You would be honored and glorified. You'll be pleased with what you find and, and have seen in us tonight. Um, our, our, our desire is to honor you, Lord, to really to honor you with our lives. So we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, dearly beloved. Again, this is recorded, and I will put it up on the YouTube if I can figure out how to do it. So, otherwise, I bid you adieu. God bless. Oh, there it is. Hold fast. Come on, Jim Davis. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. I'm just looking. I'm just in the chat. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Go to the log. Bye. Uh. That was cool. So, yeah. They were on the wheel of that phantom ship. They rolled fast. Yeah.